some of the clients that we're working with right now to help them find a property in Bend. So appreciate everyone logging on here today. Let's see, Aaron, uh, let's just give it about one or two more minutes. Uh, do you have any questions that are already popping up that you uh, think would be worth uh, discussing before we get going? Yeah, there's a couple that have just come up already. Um, I think one that uh, seems to be a burning question for everybody right now, and I'm sure you'll touch on it a little, but it's interesting that it's the first one. The question is, is it less expensive to build versus buying right now in this market? And I think it's something we're seeing a lot with, you know, our sellers who are looking to build instead or our buyers just entering the market, you know, what the right plan is for them. So. Yeah, we'll definitely discuss that. And it's it's been a moving target. So what we saw over the last number of years um, was that it made sense to buy existing inventory um, just because the construction costs have, have been so high. Um, we have seen some plateau off in that. Um, some of the, the supply chains have caught up and the labor pool has increased a little bit. So the construction costs are plateauing a little bit. Um, what we're really seeing though is a pinch point on the land values. Um, we've had a, a big run on land in the last year in Bend. And so it's, it's, re, it's brought up that replacement cost. Uh, so it's, it's a tougher thing to pursue. Um, but there are some opportunities. Um, and, and the biggest pinch point we have right now is in standing existing inventory. Um, so if you are willing to shop around, find the right lot, um, you know, find the right builder that's gonna do a, a price point, a cost efficient build for you, there are some opportunities to get in below these current prices. Downside of that is obviously you're not in for one to two years. Um, and then the other downside is you're unable to lock in the interest rates that we've got in today's world. But um, that's a good question. We'll get to that. So I'm going to get going right now. It looks like we've got a fair amount of people on. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So I'm Brian Ladd, uh, principal broker here at Cascade Sotheby's and the Ladd Group. I've got Erin Martin on with us. Uh, she's a broker on the team and our listing manager. And what we're going to do today is do a quick recap on what's happening in the residential real estate market here in Bend, Oregon. I'm going to look at it from an econ, you know, a bigger, higher level as well, from a holistic economic perspective of what's happening in the economy, what's happening, co happening with COVID, et cetera. Um, and then we're going to try to boil it down and finish it with some very strategic takeaway tips, uh, whether you're a buyer or a seller in this market. We feel that you can be successful in both at this point, um, but it's a this market is um, definitely uh, needing your attention. And so before we talk about anything else, and this is what we've been talking about in our webinars for the last you know, nine months now, is that we need to start with talking about COVID. It was the absolute great disruptor to our economy, to the housing market, uh, not to mention all the horrible health effects and, and, and spinoff it's had. Um, but if, if we're talking about it with just real estate, um, it really changed this town. It changed migration, migration trends um, of how, how people were moving here, uh, behavioral change um, of how you know, people were using their house full, part-time, um, office versus home. Um, and the real estate market has become really more dynamic and complicated than ever before. And, and what we've really seen is, is that real estate in Bend can no longer, you know, you, you can't casually shop or buy or even sell in this market. And there's a lot of panic and a lot of hyperbole and a lot of headlines that have led um, for a lot of, you know, has built up a lot of angst in the real estate market. And so we, you know, we at the Lad Group at the beginning of last year said, okay, our sole role is to be the interpreter of what's happening and so that we can, you know, kind of filter through all the headlines and bring some good data to our clients so that they can manage these times. And so when it's as tumultuous as it is now, data is more important than ever. And, you know, we really appreciate all the people that chose to work with us over the last year because we were able to keep them on track in, in otherwise a very scary time. And I used this picture a couple months ago in one of our presentations, but I think it we have to, even though it's only nine months ago, we have to talk about a reminder of where we were at. Um, when we were in March and April of 2020, um, it was an absolute panic. Um, sales stopped for two months in a row and the word on the street, whether it be a developer, a real estate agent, or you know someone that is trying to enter or exit the market, 
there was panic, there was fear, and the headlines were, you know, is this 2008 all over again? I don't feel comfortable. There's too much happening or the market's about to crash. So I'm not going to touch it. And it was that type of emotion that led to a lot of bad decision-making. And when we sat down and looked at the data, here's a few slides from a presentation that we did last spring. The data didn't support a doomsday scenario. While the pandemic was horrible with health effects, the real estate market had really strong fundamentals below it. Um, we had very limited inventory. We had high amounts of equity. We had low amounts of leverage. We had demographics at play where we had all these households that need to be formed with millennials coming into their, their earning years, et cetera, that really supported, you know, and not to mention migration trends from the urban centers to, to smaller second tier metro areas like then, that were all in play. And every piece of data we, that we looked at supported that the real estate market was going to chug on right through this, but there were people that would not touch the market um, and or they were going to sell at a panic price. So I think the data really helped people navigate that. And we've had some updates to that. And I think it, it's going to be important to talk about that today. One of the big things we talked about last year, and I've been preaching this over and over again, is that pandemic was quickly correlated to a recession. We were going into a recession regardless of, of COVID. But when those two were combined, everyone freaked out and said, okay, housing's gonna crash, right? And the big thing that we talked about was that housing is not correlated with recessions. And what we showed this graph last spring that in three of the last five recessions, housing prices actually went up. Obviously the one that was fresh in our mind was the 2008 recession, right? That's when housing prices crashed, but it had more to do with the subprime mortgages and, and, and all the financial, um, connection uh, that had historically not been there between the overall economy and housing. Um, and, but we were saying, hey, just because we have a recession coming doesn't mean that we're gonna have a housing crash. And in fact, all the data we're looking at, housing is probably gonna be the leading indicator, the strongest point of this recession. And now we've got the data. And so this is the last five recessions. Now we have the data. Now we have the last six recessions and now we've got 2020 on the books. And now this is showing that in four of the last five, four of the last six recessions now, housing prices went up. And this was a nationwide statistic showing that housing prices nationwide last year went up about 7.3%, which was more than we've seen in the past. Um, but now the data is there. We obviously have to get through this recession. I don't know when they're gonna designate the official end of it. Um, but it's showing uh, that, it's, that it's holding true to the data that, that we've interpreted so far. Yeah, we're just about to launch a poll for everybody to kind of understand you know, what your perspective is on this, whether or not you think polls are gonna continue to rise, whether you think they're gonna decrease, or prices specifically, or maybe re stay relatively the same is a question there. And then we also thought, you know, a lot of people just aren't sure right now. So we left a little question that said, not sure, tell me more, because they're really wanting to fully understand it. I think this kind of, the future of the pricing in Bend is certainly a hot topic. It's one of the first questions we get asked when we sit down at the table with our clients. Wouldn't you agree, Brian? Yeah, I think this is really important. And I'm watching these poll results come in and, and we'll talk about these here in a second. You can publish the result. What's so interesting about this is that when we published this poll, when we did our uh, webinar last April, we had 80 to 90% of the people saying that housing prices were gonna decrease substantially and now I'm looking at this and we're looking at 64% of the people so far are thinking that prices are going to continue to rise and that we've only got 5% of the people that think that prices will decrease substantially. So it's a huge mind shift that we've all gone through in the last year. And I think it's one of the reasons that we've all sprouted some gray hairs um, and we're just trying to deal with the amount of change that we've all seen in the last year. It has been an absolute whipsaw of a year and uh, housing is, it doesn't, you know, isn't, isn't immune to that. Um, Aaron, were you able to share that result? If, I think that's, a, that's an interesting one. I did um, share it, yeah. So. Good, so that's a great question. Thanks for bringing that up. So I think before we talk about any specifics of the real estate market, I think we, the, the, the real, um, underlying story of 2020 that helped support all this was really the growth, um, the growth of home equity. 
um, how much people have in equity in their houses through this, through this tumultuous time. And, and I have a quote here that says, and this is from Frank Nothoff. He's a chief economist of CoreLogic, an awesome data aggregator in our industry. And he said, quote, over the past year, strong home price has created record level for home equity for homeowners. The average family with home mortgage had $194,000 in home equity in the third quarter. And that really provided an important buffer to protect families if they experience financial difficulties. And it is the one reason for the generational low in foreclosure rates. Obviously, the other reason for the low in foreclosure rates is the moratorium that we've had on it. Um, and we talked more about that in our last webinar. I can bring it up if, if anyone has any questions. Um, and this home equity has really provided a lot of padding for people to get through these times. Um, I think number one, um, nationwide, over 2020, the average American had about an extra $17,000 of equity gain in their home. And this was in a time where a lot of people were losing jobs, people were getting you know, pay cuts, there was a lot of insecurity in the world. And to have that home equity in their home continue to grow um, provided that buffer. Um, the average equity in mortgage homes in the US is a, a skyrocketing number, it's $194,000. And this is very, very different from the times that we saw in the early 2000s in 2004, five, six, seven, leading up to that correction. Americans had very little equity in their home. They were all using their homes like ATMs. Every time they had a little equity, they would do a cash out refinance, buy a new boat. Um, they were speculating, they were, they were buying 5% down mortgages. Um, and it's a very, very different world. And, and all it did was take a little bit of an economic disruption and even a flattening in housing prices for people to be upside down. And then it starts to snowball. If people are upside down and they have negative equity in their home and they lose their job, it's easier to throw the keys back to the bank than it is to, to sell it. And we're in a situation where people have so much equity in the home, really just that it, it, we, we don't see any sort of foreclosure crisis coming. Um, what was really surprising to me was that almost 40% of Americans own their homes you know, free and clear. Um, and let me see if I can go back here. Now, this is a chart that was put together showing the average equity gain. And as you can see, Oregon, the whole West Coast really, um, led the way in equity growth. So for the average Oregonian, they had an equity growth in their house in 2020 of about $23,000 in what was otherwise, you know, a little bit of a dumpster fire of the year, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that's, that plays into a lot of things that we're gonna talk about. And so, you know, Frank Martel, he's also from, from Cord Logic, he said that the housing market has remained a strong pillar in what was an otherwise tumultuous economic year. A sharp rise in demand, spurred by record low interest rates, continue to bolster home ownership equity. And with more people spending time at home than or more time than ever before at home, some homeowners have tapped into their strength in equity to fund renovations. Um, so you know, that, that storyline is, is, is very much going to play into what we're going to talk about here as we go into what, what's ahead for us here in 2021. So housing has really changed and the definition of what a house does and, and what it means to a homeowner has really changed. Uh, David Maley, he's president of homes.com said the surge in the work from home population has really rewritten the playbook for many home buying and rental decisions from when and where to relocate to what people are looking for in their next residence. And no one has experienced this more so than what we have here in Central Oregon Bend. Um, as these urban centers unwound a little bit and you know, all these companies said, okay, not only can you work from home, you have to work from home, let's work remotely. Um, it really just unleashed a wave of, of working from home or working from you know, these, these you know, lifestyle towns like Bend, um, a wave of people coming here at a level that we just never really expected. And it has a dramatic effect on our market. These are headlines that I pulled out for, you know, six months ago, but it, it has not, this trend has not changed. San Francisco, Seattle, all the big urban centers, their downtown cores are losing people in droves. Um, rental prices are plunging, vacancy rates are increasing, and the suburbs of those cities and then the, the remote or the, the accessible second tier metro areas like Bend are absolutely in the crosshairs uh, for where those people are going. 
And I think, you know, just anecdotally, Brian, I feel like it's worth saying it's not necessarily true that all of these are brand new folks who are newly interested in Bend. And um, I do think it's an accelerated, like you said in the beginning, it's people who had already had Bend on their radar and they just moved up their plans kind of a thing. Wouldn't, yeah. Yeah, that's great. I mean, we were talking about that not too long ago where not only was COVID the great disruptor, it was the great accelerator. Right. So anyone that had thoughts of living in Bend in the next one, two, five, ten years, it seems that, you know, it seemed to accelerate all their decision to one year. Right. You know, when when their kids were not in school where they could work remotely, um, it just seemed to accelerate a lot of plans. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, Mark Fleming. Uh, Chief Economist at First American, he said, despite the best intention of home builders to provide more housing supply, the big short housing supplies will continue into 2021 and likely keep high house price appreciation flying high. Um, definitely in Bend, we have limited ability to react to market shocks like we saw right now. Um, we did a webinar last year on the urban growth boundary expansion. And uh, I invite you to watch that if you have some more questions or if you have any questions about it, we can bring it up today. Um, and in that last urban growth boundary expansion that took, you know, I think about 10 years to get passed and they added 2,300, 2,400 acres. Um, but the availability of readily developable land, and by that I mean water, sewer access, ready to, to go in for, for building permits is simply not there and definitely not there to keep up with the demand that we've seen this year. And of course, all those factors come together in housing prices. So I put together two charts here. This is a five-year chart. Um, the top one shows a 12-month of rolling data. So it's, it's a 12-month average. And what that shows is that in April 2020 over April 2021, we saw a 17.5% year-over-year increase in prices. Um, that is an absolute shock to the system and is you know, almost 3x the historical norm. And where it really showed up is on the graph on the bottom. Uh, not to get too wonky, but I turned it into a three month moving average to really show really more what's happening in the last quarter. And that shows us that our moving average is actually at $638,000 and that's up 29.3% year over year. So to see a 30% increase in our housing prices in a year um, is, it makes everyone take pause and really, I think it, this is where we need to get deep into the data and not get too reactionary or emotional, just as we had to kind of calm ourselves and, and, and make ourselves take a deep breath in March and April of last year as the pandemic sat in, you know, set in. I think we need to do the same right now and dig into the data and understand what's causing this and try to make some sense of where this is going to go. And I think we've got some good data um, on that. And Erin, do you have any questions or any more polls before we jump ahead? Well, there's one thing, you know, I think we hear this catchphrase of, you know, are we in a bubble all the time? And, and I think it really it's clickbait and headlines that a lot of kind of the media outlets are using. I think it's worth addressing just once again, for the record, kind of how prices, how supply and demand really plays into that. And the fact that the equity is really kind of keeping us, you know, really buoyed. Do you want to speak to that a little just because it's a fear? Yeah, so anytime someone sees something go up like that, there's always a saying, well, everything reverts to the mean, right? Um, you know, there's always a bubble, there's always a cycle. Housing really is an odd industry. It really, you know, marches to its own drummer and is very much a supply and demand um, driven um, industry in the sense that it doesn't tie into the larger macroeconomic factors that you think it might. It really has to do with historically in the US since the 1950s, housing has about a seven to 10 year cycle where there's a strong buildup. Um, the demand is there, the builders then go meet it, then there's an oversupply. And when then there's an oversupply, then the prices soften for about a two to three year period before getting on with itself. What we've really seen in the last 15 to 20 years in the US is that the threshold for building new neighborhoods, new homes have become so exorbitantly high. Uh, builders used to be able to go buy a piece of land. I'm not saying this is good, but they used to be able to buy a piece of land, tap into the existing utilities, get it approved in three to six months, and they're building homes within a year. The barriers to doing that, especially in Oregon with our land planning laws, are not three to six months. It can be measured in that many of years, three to six years. So 
builders simply cannot put on land fast enough. And then the other big threshold is, is that all, all these cities have aging infrastructure, um, parks, uh, they need sewer ex, you know, extensions and water extensions and, and facilities. Um, what they're doing is they're putting a that big load onto the new builds. They have a lot of SIST, SDC fees, system development charges um, that makes building permits used to be a couple hundred bucks. Now they're twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars, even before you, you know, factor in the land. So you know, a lot of these builders are trying to build affordable homes, but even before they, you know, dig that hole in the dirt, they're often in these this, these lots and permits for one hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars, even before they put a stick in the ground. Um, so it's it's really hard to keep up with demand like they used to. And then we have this just wave of household formations that have been kind of repressed for the last 10 or 20 years. And anecdotally, everyone likes to say the millennials were, you know, sitting at their parents' home eating avocado toast and they need to go out and buy a house. Um, partially true, uh, but there was just a lot of household formations that all came on at once. And what we're really seeing is, is the, the transfer of wealth now from baby boomers to, 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 to their children. And so what we're seeing is this boom for housing demand all happening at a time where we have a shortage. Um, and then we throw on a pandemic and this change in buyer behavior and, and moving to cities like Bend. It's just something we've never experienced before. Uh, so the bubble that you just put up, Erin, can you share the results on that? I did um, share them, yeah. Okay, perfect. This is pretty split. So about a third of you are saying, hey, I think we're in a housing bubble. You know, just over a third are saying, hey, I don't think we are. And then a third is saying, hey, I don't know. And I, I definitely get all three of those. Um, I, you know, depending on the day, I could say yes to all three. Um, but I think we've got some good data that we'll get to here in just a minute. Um, so let's go to the pros. Um, you know, we can have all the, the anecdotal evidence and stories that we want. Um, but what we did is we there's this forecaster that was put together. It used National Association of Realtors, Realtor.com, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, CoreLogic, Mortgage Bank, Bankers, et cetera. They're all predicting um, very strong appreciation for next year. The average right now that they're putting out is right around 5% with some above, some a little bit more um, tempered. Um, but nationwide, a 5% appreciation going into throughout 2021 is what's predicted. Um, and to be honest, I think we're gonna see that plus plus here in Ben. Um, and we'll get to the data on why I, why I think that. So the, the, the big driver that I see driving prices or, or providing that downside support from, from prices going down is really about inventory. You know, Aaron, and you could tell us a story about trying to find homes in this market, um, but inventory is our biggest challenge. So. As you can see, this graph that I that I put up, this is a five-year graph. This shows that every December, January, the inventory goes down a little bit, and then it starts climbing. And every July, August, we peak in the amount of homes that we have. Historically, we have about six months of inventory, which means that if nobody brings on a new house to sell, we'll sell out of the current inventory in about six months. What happened is, is that as we started getting near the end of 2019, 2020, we were already uncomfortably low in inventory, but at that point we were at four and a half months of inventory as opposed to six. And we're saying, this is a little uncomfortable. Sellers are kind of driving the market. It's hard to find a home. And then it just fell off of a cliff. And so we went, historically, when we were at about six months of inventory in our peak season in May, 2020, we were down to about four and a half. And then it just fell off as the buyers came into town. Um, and people weren't as, as willing to put their home on the market. Uh, we just didn't have enough homes and it has absolutely been decimated. So right now we're at about two and a point nine months, but that's really using my 12 month average. And if I do that three months average again, we're down to 1.6 months of inventory. Um, so that's about 45 days of inventory. And if I were to measure it on a day by day basis and just say, take a snapshot of today compared to a year ago, we're actually down about 80 or 90%. We're down to about a 10 day inventory. Um, and that's a, you know, so even that 1.6, that's down 60% of the amount of homes that we have for sale year over year. Erin, do you have any stories that can add to that or, or, or add some color to that? Well, I think we're certainly experiencing it both on kind of on our listing on our selling side. And also when we're talking to our buyers, brokers who are out there kind of in the thick of it with their clients, you know, there's multiple offers on almost every property. It's a classic supply and demand situation. And, and I think um, 
uh, I think one of the other factors that really plays into it, of course, is um, the fact that people are wanting a finished completed home right now. So certainly there is land, certainly there is the opportunity to build. I know there's a couple questions on that and we'll get to those with regard to price per square foot for building. Yeah. Um, but I think what's driven this so you know firmly is just that people are really wanting to be able to get in and you know call something home quickly. And so they're willing to kind of take what's on the market and eaten up a lot of that inventory that we've seen. And then I think what you said also um, with regard to people not wanting to list, there's a couple of reasons they don't want to sell their home right now, which is limiting the inventory also. We'll talk about them in detail, but among them are where do I go, you know, because of the inventory. So it's a little chicken and egg, if you will, on that. Yeah, yeah. so this survey, great timing. Yeah, this survey that was put together said, hey, if, you, if you're not selling your home, why not? And um, I think Aaron touched on one that's particularly salient for the Bend market, but you know this result showed it was pretty split, about a third, a third, a third. One is financial uncertainty. Um, one, you know, COVID health concerns, which I think that as that wanes, we should see some inventory coming out. Um, but then another third is kind of just general unease. It's hard to put a finger on it. Life's just too uncertain right now. My not, job's not overly secure. I can't figure out what's going on with housing. I don't know where COVID's gonna, when COVID's gonna end. I don't know where my kids are gonna go to school this fall. And so people don't want to then, you know, kind of throw, a, you know, a bomb in and just blow up their life and say, and by the way, we're gonna sell it and, and, and try to buy a new home. And so a lot of people just decided not to put their home on the market. And I think what Aaron talked about, which we, there has to be a real strategy behind to overcome and we have been able to navigate that is where am I going? Because even if my house is worth more, I want to sell, I want to buy a new home. That market is so tough. It's that it's not easy to find. So there's not enough inventory out there for people to feel comfortable saying, okay, I'm going to put my house in the market. I'll sell it. And then I'll go find the right home. They're looking out there and they're saying, there's nothing I want, or there's only one at a time and it's getting multiple offers. What if I sell myself out from a house? And that's that strategy that we can talk about, but that's a huge factor in why we're not seeing homes um, come on the market here this year. Um, Realtor.com did say though that the bright spot for buyers is that more homes are likely to become available in the last six months of 2021. That should give folks more options to choose from and take away some of their urgency. With the larger selections, buyer may not be forced to make a decision in mere hours and will have more time to make up their mind. And that's really one of my big hopes for the um, for 2021 is, is that we're going to see more inventory come on the market. And I think it's not only likely, I think it's very, very probable, um, but it's going to take some time, say, take some time to really show up. Uh, yeah, we've just launched another, you know, kind of one of our, our last polls because we think this is really interesting. We're wanting to know from you all whether or not you think there will be more inventory and where you think that inventory is coming from, you know, specifically with regard to new construction, but also kind of this, what we call shadow, these resale homes, you know, people listing their home, ready to move on. Yeah, and, you know, I was just talking with a few different builders this morning. We do have more inventory coming. I mean, the builders would love to be able to meet this demand, um, but it's going to be measured in years. They're not going to be able to catch up this summer with enough new construction to really make a dent. Um, most of it is going to come through resales. Um, and I think what a lot of it's going to be, unfortunately, is that there's going to be some turnover in the town. Um, what we're going to there's, there's just like we had an acceleration of people wanting to be in Bend, I think that we're going to have an acceleration of people that were saying, okay, I'm going to go retire somewhere warm. I want to put my toes in the sand. I don't, you know, I don't need to use my own bachelor. I don't need to interact with winter anymore. Um, and they've all been holding off for the last one, two, five, ten years. And I think that with the appreciation that we've seen in housing, Likewise, I think we can see a little bit of a wave and unleashing of those to come on the market this fall. Um, and then I think COVID plays particularly into that because as generally what we see is, is as people leave Bend, sometimes it's a little on the older spectrum um, of you know wanting to go find a retirement place a little warmer. Um, they're probably even more sensitive to what we're having on in COVID. That's a little bit of anecdote and, and conjecture at that point. Um, but I do think that that seller demographic is a little bit more sensitive to what's happening in the health front. And as we get you know, vaccines and, and, and get the, the rates down, which they're falling well, it's, 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 hard, you know, it's encouraging to see, um, but I think that's gonna take some time. So Aaron just put up that result. Do you wanna go over that? 
Yeah, I mean, I just think it's overwhelming um, how many people think that just a modest number of homes are going to come. They don't believe that we're going to see a ton of inventory, nor will it be quite as shallow of a pool as it's been. Um, we've still got a couple of people who are saying not really sure yet, you know, either because they just don't know and want to wait and see, or maybe just we kind of need to educate everyone more. But I think it's interesting, and I think it's probably a fair middle ground, which is what we're expecting as well. Yeah, yeah so I, unfortunately, I don't see a huge surge coming, but I do see some relief, right? So now let's talk a little bit about the overall economy. Um, it's been an interesting year. Now, what we talked about last year was that this economic disruption was going to be severe, more depth, but it was going to have less length than, than the other um, recessions that we talked about. You know, when we were talking about unemployment, double digit unemployment rates, equal, you know, 15% greater than the Great Depression of the 1930s. Um, it was a very scary time and it was hard for us all to compartmentalize and find a place to put a data like that that we've never seen in our lifetime somehow into the decision making of how we operate in real estate. Um, that said, the, um, the government did do a really good job in, in, in stimulus and, and they put a lot of you know, gas on that fire to, to aid in that recovery, um, but it was a very quick snapback. Um, and what it did is, is that shortened that unemployment time period um, to try to keep people out of trouble um, so that they didn't lose their houses and cause a foreclosure issue like we went through back in 2008. Um, so that yellow chart shows what the actual unemployment dip was. Um, we went to almost 15% nationwide uh, earlier last year, but it snapped back quite quickly. Um, and most economists are guessing that we're going to be back to pre-recession unemployment in about three to five years, although I just read something by Janet Yellen yesterday who believes that with the, if the current stimulus package, the one that's being proposed is actually put in place, she's projecting full, not, or full um, unemployment uh, by the end of 2022. So that's a year and a half from now. Um, so I think that's, there's obviously a lot of people still suffering. I know people in the, you know, the hotel industry and I know people in the restaurant industry and they would look at this and be like, that's just not true. There are certain sectors that are absolutely still suffering, but the overall economy is showing a fair amount of resilience to that. Um, and then if we look, you know, these, this is just chart, we don't need to get too deep into it, but most um, economists are predicting that by 2023, we're back down to three, 4% unemployment, which in a lot of people's eyes is, is really kind of full employment uh, for the US. So I think that's all very encouraging. Um, you know, Jung Han Choi, I apologize, I can't say the name. Um, she put forth, she's part of the um, uh, Urban Institute and she put together a quote saying, renters are just disproportionately hurt by this crisis. A greater share of renters lost their jobs. And then that meant losing savings that could have been uh, used for a down payment and falling behind on bills, which will hurt their credit um, and make it even more difficult for them to be future homeowners. So for people who were fortunate enough to own a home going into this recession, as we talked about earlier, their home equity went up, they did quite well. Um, but this was a little bit of a kind of a two-part recovery. It's that K recovery we were talking about that's, that's, you know, that's hitting people different ways. And for people that were on outside of the housing market prior to this, they've been especially punished and it's, it's, it's um, quite unfortunate. And hopefully there's some housing policy that will help them recover. Um, but you know, this just underscores now more than ever that being a homeowner, being in the real estate market long-term um, is a security blanket to some of these, these disruptions that happen in the market. And what we're also seeing right now is even more so than the price increases on housing is that those rental rates are absolutely going through the roof. Um, and when someone is insecure about housing and they're just trying to stay in a rental, to, it's been very tumultuous and very tough on the renters. Um, and, you know, there's, there's some Oregon land use, or some, there was a Senate bill that was put forth last year on how much an, uh, a landlord can increase the price, things like that. And that is really worthy of a whole webinar on its own. Um, land, you know, and, and I think it'd be interesting to talk about what it's like to be a landlord, what it's like to be a tenant in this market. Um, but it's been very tough to be a tenant uh, in Bend over the last year. So, the quick reaction is, is that we go through all this and say, well, who cares where we're at right now? We bounce back and it must be a bubble, right? 
And I'm not going to disagree with anyone, um, but I think it's worth looking at some data. Now, this was a data point that was new to me um, that, I, that really demands some attention. And this is really, this is an affordability uh, index. Um, and, and this chart on the left goes back to 1990. And the bigger the number, the better. What that shows is that how affordable housing is. Um, and what it really showed is, is that during the recession, 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, housing was incredibly affordable during those times. But at that time, it, we had a worse job economy and there was a lot of other things going on. But if you actually look at where we stand today in 2020, housing in a historical perspective, I know it's hard to stomach, is actually more affordable than it was in the 70s, 80s, and 90s as a percentage of your monthly payment, your monthly income. And a lot of people are gonna say, how can we have 20%, 25% appreciation in housing and yet housing is still more affordable? And that really has to do with one fact, these crazy low interest rates. And so that chart on the right, this shows uh, interest rates dating back I don't even know how far that's, that, that one wasn't even that far, but it shows where we've come in interest rates. We're down to just under 3% for a 30 year. And what that's um, done is, is that it's kept housing historically affordable in a monthly payment um, terms, especially, you know, obviously if you have a loan. And so this is where we get into the data. This chart here on the left shows an inflation adjusted mortgage monthly payment. And so this takes, this has different years and it has 2000, 2006, 12, 18, and then today, and that we're today in that blue chart. So what this shows is that in an inflation adjustment mortgage payment, it's actually more affordable to own a home than it was last year, than it was the year before, than 2006 or even 2000. So as a whole, we're paying less as a percentage of our income for housing than we ever have, or than we have in recent history. The only exception to that, once again, was during the depths of the recession of 2012. Um, so obviously that can be easily disrupted by a rise in interest rate, but right now that's what's really helped. That The low inventory and those low interest rates are what's continuing, the primary drivers um, that are continuing to drive forth those prices. Um, a chart on the right here that I think is important is talking about how much income you need to, to, get, to, to get a mortgage. Um, historical average is about 21%, and we're seeing that falling. So right now, you know, we're down at about less than 15%. Um, so it's getting a little more attainable, you know, a 5% less down on a $500,000 home, $25,000 less to come up with for a down payment might help some people uh, get into the housing market. Um, I hope that doesn't go too low. We start getting down to 5% or no down loans. We're going to get by ourselves back into that situation like we did in the early 2000s. Um, but I think that those factors, you know, are worth considering. And, you know, this is just another, you know, demonstration of that 30-year fixed rate mortgage of just that insanely low um, rate we have right now. I mean, that's really inflation rates. And, and in historical terms, if you loan money at 2.65%, and with the inflation rates that we have projected ahead of us, it's quote unquote free money, right? Um, obviously you have to be well leveraged and, and not uh, you know, over leveraged and all those things, but this really shows um, that impact to that mortgage. Um, I don't wanna to get too deep into this, but what this, this is just a little table that was put together by realtor.com of showing that um, with a modest increase in housing prices and an increase of housing per, uh, interest rate, from where we're at 2.7 to 3.5% by the end of the year, what it shows is that in a 30-year loan, it could actually affect your cost of ownership by about $70,000. So this is just something that you need to keep in mind if, if you're trying to bet and saying, okay, well, I bet housing prices are going to go down a little bit. I'm going to wait. What this is going to show is that more likely interest rates are going to go up and then maybe housing prices go down, who knows? But this is just showing that if in long, you know, if you plan on owning real estate for a long period of time, that interest rate change, which is probably going to go up here, and I've got a chart on it, could have a much bigger effect on your whole cost of ownership uh, than today's purchase price. 
Yeah, and we often hear, I'm priced out. And, you know, I think our, our first response is, but are you really? Have you looked into it truly? Because I think it's a perception that a lot of buyers have right now. And it's yeah. not necessarily, you know, the case. And um, when they're looking backwards, kind of towards the historic highs that we've seen in the past of 18% and all these, you know, tales that we hear, it's certainly not necessarily the case. It's a perception, right? Yeah, yeah you're right. And it's really if you're a cash buyer or if you have a loan. And, and if you have a loan, uh, the, the one thing, you know, we've been saying interest rates were, were at all time lows of three, four percent the last couple of years. They couldn't go any lower, but we really didn't have this unprecedented fiscal policy of the, the Fed just pouring money everywhere like we do right now. But what we do know now is we do have forecasts that interest rates are going up. Um, most people are forecasting that by the end of the year, they're going to be somewhere between three, 3.2, 3.5%. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's about, you know, that's almost a, you know, a third higher than what we have right now. And when we start talking that, it has a dramatic impact on, on your monthly payment. Um, Mark Fleming, he also said that rising interest rates reduce house buying power and affordability, but that's often a sign of a strong economy, which increases buyer demand. Um, by any historic standard, today's mortgage rates remain historically low and will continue to boost house buying power and keep purchase demand robust. So even if by the end of the year we're three and a half percent, that's great interest rates. Um, but what I think that, that we have right now is a little bit of an opportunity in time um, to help offset some of these gains. Because if you can get your interest rate a 30% lower than you could a year, year and a half from now, that's really gonna help offset that sting of some of the recent price appreciations that we've had. And it's hard for people to digest that because most people just look at the gross number of the house that they're buying. And it's, you know, I don't wanna be, you know, talking like a car salesman that sells on lease versus, per, you know, you know, a cash purchase. Um, but mortgage rates have a real effect um, on your total cost of ownership of the house. And I think it's, it's, it's worth, you know, talking about. Um, so Aaron, you know, now that we've talked about all these different factors, do you want to talk about some ways for buyers and sellers to be successful in this market? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that we have several tips and, and one of the biggest ones is that you really need to have really high quality support when you're in this market. It can be a tough market, um, certainly, but I think there's really a way um, for buyers to be successful. And I think it, um, I think that we've got some, some tips and tricks to do that. So I think you know, keeping an eye out for the growing inventory throughout the year. We're kind of watching that come coming up slowly. We're expecting it to come up and and being ready to kind of jump when it when it happens. So, being ready with a pre approval letter, being kind of super engaged with your agent um, to find kind of the the inventory that's about to come on the coming soon and the the things that you know with new construction and kind of the pre-sales that might be opportunities, things like that, being ahead of the game so that you'll be ready when the time comes, certainly. Um, I think taking advantage of the interest rates like we've talked about a little bit is really important. And so I think understanding what your buying power is, is essential. And then also looking a little bit below that. So we are seeing multiple offers. We're experiencing that people are getting um, kind of, you know, homes are getting bid up during the offer process. We have ways to make sure that our, you know, to, to really support our buyers and being the one that's accepted, you know, when there's five, 10, 15 offers on a property. But I think one thing is maybe not looking necessarily right at your price point, but looking kind of in that little threshold below it. So you can account for the fact that you will want to go above asking, which is just happening right now. Yeah. Um, and, and rather than, you know, um, we just think it's the best to address that head on and be really ready for it. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm going to just, I, I'm going to interrupt yeah. a second because I think there's a good point there. So Alice on our team was talking last week that she has her buyers competing when there are some of the offers that she was going in on had, or some of the houses had 20 to 25 offers on it. And so that, I mean, that means that 95% of the people submitting an offer are losing. That said, she had eight of her last nine offers accepted, right? So this is where strategy absolutely rules and you've got to be on top of the game. And this doesn't mean that we're throwing, encouraging our buyers to throw out sloppy uh, offers that have escalation clauses and, you know, with numbers wildly above asking price. What this means is having a really specific strategy um, put in place um, all the way from where when we go to submit an offer, we're meeting with that listing agent and having a seller interview. We, under, we want to understand what their timeline is, where they're moving, when they want to move, you know, all the intangibles, what do they want to leave at the house and not have to deal with. 
because there's so much beyond the house price. And, and what's happening is, is that when these agents get panicky, they're submitting, you know, emailing in these offers that are wildly above asking price, but that necessarily isn't the one that's going to attract the seller. It's going to be that one that comes in that's methodical, that's strategic, that helps the seller understand that this buyer is serious, they're going to perform, um, and they're going to meet all their needs. They're going to allow them to stay there after closing as they find their new home. Um, but you have to really be engaged in this market and, you know, paying attention even a day late, you know, in this market, you're not even in the game. I would so agree. And I think one thing that happens is, so we go through a, a home with our clients and they look us in the eye and say, this is the one we want it. And they say, and we say, okay, let's get strategic about how we're going to make this offer. And they think the first thing we're going to say is, okay, you've got a bid, you know, substantially over asking price. And there are so many non-monetary ways you can fortify your offer that I think if your agent's not talking to you about those things, they should be. And I think that's one thing that we're really doing to make sure that our buyers kind of have the most solid, well-rounded, comprehensive offer rather than just throwing money at it, trying to be, you know, escalating above an escalation, um, yeah. just how to get it. Yeah. And certainly. then the last thing on here you got is, you know, like I was talking about before with the interest rate, where betting to wait on a possible price decrease and that that fact that that's going to offset a very probable, very likely increase in interest rate is really a risky bet in this market. We're not saying, you know, real estate's always going to go up and, and it's all sunshine and rainbows and unicorns. But if I had to weigh the odds of price decreases in a market where we have this much demand and such limited supply, or an interest rate rise, I'm going to probably bet more on the interest rate rise that's going to affect your home buying ability rather than those home prices coming down. Um, Aaron, do you have any other buyer tips before we jump over to seller tips? Well, just that last one that you said, I would just, you know, reiterate that again. I think so. We hear so often from buyers who say, oh, it's too stressful. It's too hard. I've gotten beat out. I'm just going to wait. And, and ultimately what we've seen is that if they wait, they lose out on choosing Bend. They end up going to Redmond or a bedroom community or something like that, or, or they maybe, you know, wish they would have pulled the trigger earlier. Or even a second tier. We've had people say, I could have afforded Ben six months ago. I now cannot, and I'm looking in other states. And so if Ben still makes sense for you at this point, you know, buckle in your seatbelt and, and get engaged because this is, this is, it, it's go time to, to, to make it happen, you know, here and now, right? Well, and there's one thing that you always say that I think is really valuable for, for our kind of viewers is, if you're really thinking about Bend, be thinking about it for the long term, for the five, 10 year play, not just about in the next two years, will it go up or go down, you know, in a, in a subtle way. Would you, you know, kind of want to share more about that? I think it's helpful. Yeah, I mean, so I've been doing this 21 years now and I've, and I've witnessed people weather the cycles. I've seen people lose it all in the cycles. I've seen people do really well in the downturn. The people that suffer the most are people that buy highly leveraged, you know, 5% down, speculation, buy above their means, um, and then any sort of disruption exposes them. If people can buy with the correct amount of down payment, if they can buy, um, you know, without too much leverage, they can withstand the disruptions. It's, and, and, and if you don't have to exit during the downturn, you know, downtimes, you do well in the long term with real estate. You just always do. The, the, the people that had to exit in 2009 and 10 got absolutely punished. But for anyone who could wait, they're not only whole, they're way above where they were back in 2006, 2007. So it's really patience rewards real estate. Patience rewards real estate investors. It rewards homeowners. And impatience and over leverage is really what punishes people more than what I think the actual cycles punish them. It's their timelines um, and their over leverage. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how to be a seller in this market. Certainly. And we've had a couple of questions about this, even kind of in the panel. I think it's really valuable. So everyone, you know, sellers in particular, they hear that the market has gone up, you know, 11, 20, 25 percent, depending on the price point that you're in and the type of property you own. And so when they hear that, they want to see, um, you know, us suggest a list price that is substantially over what they bought it for. 
But what we're seeing is that while the market can really bear, you know, a higher list price than even makes sense with the comparables, just because the lack of inventory is creating this need and this, you know, kind of um, demand that um, ultimately is allowing us to, to go higher, you know, higher than even what the comps show. But while the market will always cure an underpriced home by way of multiple offers and, you know, kind of bidding and, and things like that, the market is still highly sensitive to overpriced homes. So we are not getting multiple offers on every home. There are homes that are still sitting on the market. And then even on top of that, the homes that are on the market for 30 or 60 days, whereas days on market used to be 120 average um, for certain price points. If they're on the market for 30 days, we hear, hey, what's wrong with it kind of a thing. So certainly it's a very um, tenuous scenario with pricing and it really you know, requires kind of a very finely tuned strategy um, in order to kind of feel like you're right priced and be successful when you're listing your home in this market. Um, yeah, we've seen yeah. several cases of this over the last year where people came on and they just stretched too far and they quickly became the brown banana on the shelf and nobody wants that last brown banana with spots on the shelf, right? They're looking for that fresh bundle of yellow ones to come out. And once you're the brown banana, it's really hard to put a bow on that and repackage it. And we've seen home selling for, you know, once you price reductions start, start, everyone extrapolates that. So if you're a buyer in the market, you'd be like, this home's been on the market the last 90 days when everything else is selling five. It's had two price reductions. I'm going to extrapolate down to here is where I'm going to make my offer. So we, you know, we've seen homes that have had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of price reductions. When I look at that and know that if they would have come out, you know, somewhere in that middle, they would have had multiple offers. They would have sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars more, and it would have, you know, been a, a great result for them. So, despite the market being this strong, you know, it still punishes greedy sellers. You know, oddly enough. Well, yeah, and, and um, you know, kind of the way that you price it is also empowering to you with other terms. So if yeah. you need a rent back or if you want, you know, you want to, whatever it might be for your home in particular, you want to waive the inspection and not mess around with that kind of thing. The right price will achieve that in this market. An overpriced home will not um, allow you the bargaining power and those types of terms. Certainly. Yeah, because like we were saying for buyers, it's not always about the almighty dollar in the sense that if a seller says, okay, I can take one, this one's $25,000 more, this one's $25,000 less. Um, but with this one, I'm able to live in my house for three or four months after closing, I get all my money, it's gonna allow me to go buy my next home in cash or 50% down, as opposed to having to make an offer on something with two loans. And so, um, yeah, you're right. It just gives you a lot more control over the sales process. And then just as importantly, if you price it well and you get 10 different offers, you essentially get to look at all those, the validity of all those 10 buyers and say, who's the most probable that's going to close. And, and that makes a big difference because when you have a house selling and that buyer fails to close, now it's been off the market for two or three months. You've missed the prime sales season of the window or the sales window of the year. And now you're coming back on the market all because you were trying to chase that extra money. So, you know, being able to kind of interview and kind of go through the, the merits of each individual offer is, is a huge bonus. Um, that often is more valuable to that seller than that extra dollar. Which is a perfect segue to go into timing. So, so many of our sellers believe because they see the inventory, the, the maximum number of sales kind of in the spring and summer. So June, July, May, June, July, they see the peak kind of sales. They think that that's the right time to list. But actually in, in reality, it's 90 days before that, at the very least 60 days before that, because you've got a 45 day transaction. Almost everyone is choosing financing right now and has for the last year because the interest rates are what they are. Um, and then you've got a couple of weeks of lead time to list it and then a couple of weeks for the, you know, the sales process and negotiation. So truthfully, while we see that, sellers believe that they need to be on when, it, when your home is green or when um, you know, the snow is gone or, or when people are out looking so that they can move in the summer, but in actuality, and Brian just wrote a really good article in Forbes on this a little while ago, the truth is that those buyers are out now. And so the right time to list is much earlier than you think because the flood of inventory hasn't come on because all those sellers are believing the same thing that it needs to be later in the spring. 
but the buyers are out now, they're hungry now, the inventory is tight now. And so actually with supply and demand the way it works, this is the right time to be listed all the way through, I would say until kind of late March, traditionally with seasons. Last year was an anomaly, of course, it was a definitely a different one, but we even saw that seasonality kind of right in early June, which we weren't expecting um, with the buyers kind of out and ready earlier than we thought. Yeah, so I think, you know, now more than ever, especially in the fact that we do believe there's going to be a little bit of a surge in inventory late in this year, kind of later than we normally expect, I think earlier the better for to be a seller in this market. And I know we've beat this drum before. We've talked about this in previous webinars, but we really just want to make sure our sellers know about that because I think it's still something we see. And, it, and, and I think, you know, hopefully we've shared it with enough people at this point, they understand. So then the other thing, and, and Brian, I'll let you kind of chat about this a little bit. So the big, the big question we always get is, is now the right time? Or, you know, should I wait until fall? Should I wait until it's two years for capital gains? Should I wait until my kiddo goes for, you know, away for school? Should I wait until everyone has a vaccine? Should I, you know, all these kinds of shoulds. And we, we hear a lot of it. And the answer is always, we don't know. We don't have a crystal ball. If anything taught us that last year did, you know, not just COVID, but also the stock market, you know, kind of correction in February and various things that kind of showed, you know, how tenuous these things can be. We don't know what the next year brings. We think we can extrapolate as best we can. But right now, if you want to, if you want to know what the known exit is for the next 60 to 90 days, we feel like we know what that looks like right now. And so that's what we can speak to. And if you want the security of kind of having that and knowing, recognizing what the price would be and um, kind of talking through what the strategy would be, that exit is right now. Um, and yeah. we can't really go beyond that. Yeah. That's a great point because real estate is not always liquid. Um, you know, it goes through ebbs and flows and, and, and it's not like an index fund in the stock market where you hit sell and you're out in, you know, a tenth of a second. Um, it takes timing. And, and so it, we're in a known market and to have a defined known market where we can measure and, and predict the number of days it would be to sell your house at a specific price range. That's a nice luxury to have. Um, and it's, it's, it just helps us put together a really defined strategy that take in all those other factors you were just talking about from capital gains tax to, you know, all those other things. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of people always, and, you know, a lot of people always think that they outperform the market, that they can cheat the market and, and sellers always say, well, I bought the house a couple hundred thousand dollars lower than what it was really worth. And I'm going to wait for just that one buyer and I'm going to try to overperform by a couple hundred thousand dollars. The problem is, is I hate to you know say it in front of everybody. Everybody thinks they bought their house less than what it was worth, and everybody wants to sell their home for more than it was worth. And while the real estate market isn't a perfect market, it's awfully good. Um, and we often try to outperform it for our sellers. Um, but you know, you, there's only so much control you can have, and and ultimately you need to make your decisions um, methodically. You need to make them over the long term, and you know that's why we're here. So. Um, you know, with that, you know, I don't, you know, I'll open up if anyone has any, any questions um, that were lingering out there or anything like that, we can answer those now, or we're going to post this on Facebook, you know, be happy to post anything there and, and we'll respond to you directly. But, you know, thank you for, for joining us today. We love um, working in this industry um, as, as tumultuous it is sometimes. And um, just know that we're here for you. And uh, more importantly, we couldn't be working in this industry if, the industry if it were not for you and your trust. So Aaron, is there anything else lingering out there before we go? Well, we did have a question about whether or not these slides will be available. They'll be available on our website. We'll send the link to the, the landing page out to everybody after this. One thing that um, did come up as a question earlier, and, and I think it's important, and I you know just wanna um, kind of speak to it a little bit. There's a question about whether or not, you know, between building and kind of buying a resale, whether or not, which is more advantageous at this point. And of course, there's the layer there of waiting and the time factor for sure. But somebody was asking specifically about price per square foot and the details of kind of what it takes to build right now. I think there's a lot of questions about that. So I think it's worth our time. For sure. Yeah. So my, there's a story now. Uh, one time my dad, he, my dad was a home builder. He was a phenomenal master home builder. And one time someone came in and walked in and handed him a set of plans. And they said, how much will it cost to build this house? And he did, he pulled the old Johnny Carson. He put it up against his head and, mm, 
And, and he just, and he's like, what do you want me to do? You know, I, every house is different. What do you want in it? Um, so it is, and I, and I say that jokingly, but every house is different, kind of depends on the market. Um, what we're generally seeing right now is a range of anywhere from kind of production oriented homes um, on flat lots with, you know, standard levels of construction with a uh, simplicity homes level of build, probably somewhere in that 225 to $250 a foot mark. And that's really for all the sticks and bricks um, and even in some of the soft costs and permitting uh, for that home. For custom homes in uh, neighborhoods like North Rim and Tethero and Aubrey Butte, um, most of the builders that we're speaking with right now are performing in that 350 to 500 a foot mark. Um, and generally what I'm seeing is, is for that level of custom, I'm seeing a lot of convergence right around that four and a quarter a foot mark. Um, and then so then obviously you need to add on cost of land on top of that. Um, and that varies pretty wildly. Um, there's lots anywhere in from bed from 150 all the way up to one point, two point, whatever. Um, but, you know, there are still some lots in West Bend for in the mid 300s on up. Um, and then, you know, in East Bend, there's there's a few floating at, you know, 100, low hundreds, 150, 175, something like that. So when you add both those together, you know, it'll change that price per square foot. Um, but if you just want to say a gross comparison of a build versus a buy, um, to be honest, at this point, it's, it's getting awfully close. Um, there's been times where it was very clear to say, hey, just buy existing inventory because you couldn't replace it for this. Um, but everything is, 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 is such in flux right now. Land costs are so expensive. I don't think you're necessarily ahead uh, building, um, but you'll be able to get exactly what you want. Um, it's probably going to be a very similar price point. Generally, we've seen new construction at about a 10 to 15 percent premium over resale homes. Um, but I, we're not, you know, there is some buyer opportunity there in new construction right now in the sense that a lot of the people that want to move to Bend right now want a house tomorrow. And they're willing to take a 10 or 15 year old home for the same price because they have to be in. And what we're often able to find is in some of these new build neighborhoods, if someone can put in a contract for a home that's going to be delivered six or nine months from now, they're often able to get a really good, you know, or just as good a deal as a used or older home because they have the patience and timing on their side. So if there's any opportunity in there, I would say it would be in the production builder neighborhoods where you can tie up a contract. Aaron, would you agree with that? Yeah, I really think so. And there are some new neighborhoods, you know, Northeast, Southeast, there's even some cool stuff coming in Shevlin West on the West side and discovery and things. So, I mean, you know, before it was slimmer pickings and now I really feel like the developers and the, and the builders are kind of coming around. They started focusing on it last year and, and now's the time. So I so agree. Yeah. Perfect. Well, it looks like that's, I, I just pulled up. I think we're out of questions for now. So we're going to put that out there. We'll put the slides or we'll put a link to where we're hosting this on our website. Um, Aaron, are you able to uh, stop the, the webinar here? I don't yeah, know we'll right. tell everybody bye. Thanks for coming, guys. And we just so appreciate it. We'll try to do these as much as possible. And we love your feedback. So thanks again. Take care. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>